This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy. I teach conflict resolution here at the School of Peace Studies, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Greening Borders Conference. This is a conference that advocates for a, an environmental conflict resolution approach to environmental conflicts and problems at our border, and that's something that William Urey will speak to in part when he when he appears on our stage shortly. I require my students to read Urey every semester. Um, among his books is one called The Third Side, which is a wonderful book about the ability of humans all around the world to live together for 99% of our, of our common history using methods that he calls third side, and these are the methods of dialogue, uh, community problem solving, and conflict resolution. And I think the future of water governance looks an awful lot like The Third Side. Um, I'll quote from Yuri's book. Not a transcendent individual or institution who dominates all, but rather the emergent will of the community. And on our border, that is a transboundary community. That is a community that consists of two countries, um, two states, indigenous peoples, tribal governments, business interests, concerned citizens, environmental advocates, landowners, public interest lawyers, you name it. A lot of folks here have a stake in these issues. And the Greening Borders Conference attempts to open a, a space for open and honest dialogue about those issues um, that brings in all of those different perspectives. And I think this matters because environmental conflict is caused on the one hand by real conditions, declining resources, increasing populations, and frankly by poor policies that encourage exploitive human practices. But it is caused on the other hand by um, disagreements between different interest groups, between different stakeholder groups, on how best to manage those conditions. So a green, healthy, resilient border is one that wages conflict resolution, collaborative problem solving, deliberative face-to-face -face discussions that include diverse and conflicting perspectives. When the, for the next two days, we'll be talking about structures that protect our border region, but these will not be walls and fences. We will be talking about regional administrative structures that promote this level of problem solving and dialogue. I do hope you'll consider joining us for the remainder of the Greening Borders Conference, which began today but extends through Thursday and Friday. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Milburn Line, Director of the Distinguished Institute for Peace and Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and welcome to all of you to the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. Now, there are a few tidbits about Dr. Yuri that we had to leave out of the program because of space issues, and I will share with you. In addition to founding the Harvard Program on Negotiating, Negotiation and co-authoring numerous books that are used in law, business, and peace studies programs, as well as the general public, Dr. Yuri has taught negotiation to tens of thousands of corporate execu executives, labor leaders, diplomats, and military officers around the world. Yuri is co-founder of eParliament, which offers 25,000 members of Congresses and Parliaments around the world an internet-based forum in which they can learn from one another about legislative solutions that have worked in each locale and together tackle global problems including climate change, energy efficiency, and terrorism. Whether working to end the Cold War, to stop civil wars, or prevent outbreaks of violent conflict through negotiation, Dr. Yuri is a bridge builder, as was rec recognized by a Distinguished Service Medal from the Russian Parliament. In fact, the only reason we were able to bring him here tonight was because a congressional delegation, a CODEL, to the Middle East that he was to accompany had to be postponed. And we know that he will be back there in the region soon to continue his work for peace and also his most recent passion, the Abraham Path. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me, join me in welcoming Dr. William Yuri.
Well, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here this evening, and I really want to express my deep gratitude to the Institute for Peace and Justice, to the School of Peace Studies, to Mrs. Joan B. Crock for this opportunity and this privilege to be with you. And I'd like to really also acknowledge the delegates to the Greening Borders Conference, uh, because I think there's a lot of hope in that, in actually bringing about some environmental conflict resolution. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the presence of our guests from Mexico, Buenas Noches, and also the representatives of the tribal leaders who are here, who I understand helped begin the, the conference earlier uh, today with some bird singing uh, to, to remind us of what, what actually this conference is all about. You know, 30 years ago, or actually closer to 33, when I started my studies of international conflict and my involvement in international conflicts, there were no schools for peace studies. There, were, there was no institute for peace and justice. There were, there were hardly any, there was no, certainly no conference on environmental conflict resolution. Uh, there were no courses, really, on negotiation or mediation. And so it's, it, it's a distinct pleasure to kind of recognize the, the progress that's being made in the field. Over the last 30 years, I've had the pleasure of watching, the privilege of watching and witnessing a revolution taking place in the world today, a quiet revolution, a revolution that accompanies the knowledge revolution, but it's quieter. It's a revolution in the way in which individuals such as ourselves, our organizations, our communities, our societies at large, and the way in which we make decisions. Because a generation ago, the principal form of making decisions was very much top-down. The people on top of the organizational pyramids gave the orders. The people on the bottom of the organizational pyramids followed the orders. Increasingly, over the last 30 years, in great part due to the information revolution, the knowledge revolution, the, the basic structure of organizations has begun to flatten into networks more resembling uh, networks that you might call networks of negotiation, from pyramids of power to networks of negotiation. I mean, if you think, for example, about your own lives for a moment, I just invite you for a moment to think about your own lives and think about if I were to define negotiation very simply and very broadly as the act of back and forth communication. You're trying to reach some kind of agreement. You have some interests which are shared. You have, other, like for example, an ongoing relationship with a, with a business partner or with a family member, and some issues in tension, like you might want more money for your products and services, they might want to pay you less, some, some issue. If you think about it in that sense, who do you find, if, if I may just ask you a couple of questions about your own experience, who do you find yourself negotiating with in the course of your day? <laughs> who do you find yourself negotiating with in the course of an average day? Your wife, your spouse. Okay, we'll start right there. Who else? Yourself. yourself. You negotiate with yourself, of course, right there. Who else do you negotiate with? Children. Your children. Okay, those are some of the tough negotiations. <laughs> Who else do you negotiate with? Your, your employees, your boss. Professors. I'm sorry, professors, exactly. <laughs> professors, colleagues. Okay, so if you think about that for a moment, just, just reflect for a moment and think. In the course of your day, if you had to make a ballpark estimate, a guess, of how much of your time you spend engaged in the act, informally, of back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement on some issue, however small, what percentage of your time would you estimate it to be? What would you say? Anybody? Eighty percent? Okay. How many would say it's at least a quarter of my time, if you think about it? How many would say it's over 50% of my time? Okay, quite a few. How many would say it's over 75%, you know, that 80? Okay, so quite a few still. So regardless of how much time it is, it's a huge chunk of our time. We don't always think of it as negotiation, but in the broader sense, that's, that's what we're doing from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. Now think for a moment about the last 10 years of your uh, 10 years for a moment, 10 years ago, if you imagine, do you think that as you've as you've progressed in either your educational career or your work career, do you find that the amount of negotiation that you've done has pretty much stayed the same? Has it gone down over time or has it gone up? What would you say? Up. Huh? How many would say up, just out of curiosity? 
Okay, the vast majority. That's what I'm talking about. That is the negotiation revolution. And I've seen it taking place in this country, in Mexico, all through Latin America, all through the world where I've traveled, Asia, Europe, Africa. It's a global revolution in the way in which decisions are made. So we're, we're pioneers. This is the first generation in which we've had to deal. It's not that negotiation, negotiation's gone on forever, but the amount of negotiation, the complexity of negotiation has increased. And so that's what we're faced with at this point. And as that shift has taken place, it doesn't mean that conflict has gone down. If anything, what's happened is a lot of suppressed conflicts come to the surface. And so we're living in an era where I would say conflict is a growth industry. <laughs> and conflict itself is not a bad thing. It's natural. It's human. So the choice we have is not really whether to eliminate conflict. The choice is whether we ch choose to handle our differences in destructive ways through family feuds, through lawsuits, through ruinous strikes, or through violence and war, or whether we choose to deal with our differences constructively through listening, through dialogue, through negotiation, through collaborative problem solving, through nonviolent action. That's the choice, is whether we can transform those conflicts. And for me, having spent the last 30 years in this field, uh, and I have a, I'm a little bit of a sucker for lost causes, so I go to all, I've been to Chechnya and Yugoslavia and Sudan and Ethiopia, South Africa, I mean, Indonesia, just about just visiting uh, the places of deep conflict. Uh, what I've found is that actually the secret of peace is actually very simple. Uh, the secret of peace is not very complex. The secret of peace is actually our oldest human heritage. The secret of peace, as, as the indigenous societies know, and I've spent time with a number of indigenous societies, every society in the world has its own form of it. And it's something that I call the third side. What is the third side? The third side is basically us. It's the community of people, the friends, the allies, the neighbors, uh, the people in conflict themselves who constitute the whole, their ability to circle around, like this conference right now on greening borders is circling around, is, is convening a community of the voices, all, a lot of voices that haven't been properly heard, properly respected, uh, whether it's voices of indigenous groups, whether it's voices on both sides of the border, whether it's voices of environmental groups, civic groups, voices of businesses, bringing all of them together in a community. And I, I watched this happen, for example, I spent some time many, many years ago with uh, a group of, or several groups of uh, San tribesmen, the so-called Bushmen in southern Africa and in, in Botswana and Namibia, who were still practicing the vestiges of the lifestyle that was really the human, our human lifestyle for 99% of our time on earth of existing in roving bands, uh, hunting and gathering in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in nature there. And what I noticed about them is uh, they have a very simple society in some sense, but they have a complex and quite sophisticated system for managing conflicts. And they have a real dilemma, which is they actually all, uh, certainly all the men have weapons that are used for hunting, where because their arrows are not very strong, they use uh, the poison uh, from a beetle dung that turns out to be extremely poisonous to human beings. And so, uh, you know, a human being will die in two days. So they have the challenge of how do we deal with our differences when emotions go up? How do we deal with it? And what they do is, I watch them as they, they assemble in a circle. Uh, all the men, the women particularly, the children even, and they'll sit and they'll talk out their issues. They'll, they, they constitute a third side. They'll talk it out, they'll listen out, it may take two or three days, they ask, uh, they ask the, the heavens for help uh, in any way that they can. And they don't rest until the conflict is not only resolved, but there's some process of forgiveness, of reconciliation, where the relationship is restored. And if emotions are still too high, you know, the, someone will, they have a cooling off period, why don't you go and visit some relatives for a while, come back in a few months, they, they have a whole system to do it. Uh, when, when, when emotions start to go up in the society, everyone's got an ear to it. Someone goes and hides the poison arrows out in the desert. And uh, 
that's what happens, and I've seen that happen among every indigenous society. In fact, every society really has these ways of convening the community. And as I looked at in much more, you know, much larger and complex societies like South Africa, when I began in this field 30 years ago, um, the impossible conflicts were South Africa, the blacks and whites were going to fight forever, civil war forever. Northern Ireland, Catholics and Protestants were going to kill each other forever. The Cold War itself, the Berlin Wall would be there forever. And I watched as all of those conflicts previously considered impossible, in fact, yielded to patient, persistent negotiation and the transformation of the conflict. It doesn't mean the conflict ends. But the way in which the conflict is handled, the conflict in Northern Ireland, for example, hasn't ended, but it's been transformed from violent means to peaceful democratic means. And that's really the opportunity that's available for all of us. If I might just share one, one uh, story that came to me um, uh, a number of years ago, at a time when there seemed to be more promise for negotiations in the Middle East, I was invited to Israel and Palestine to spend some time talking with Palestinian and Israeli negotiators and sharing some experiences. And at one point I was asked if I would also uh, facilitate a meeting of Palestinians and Israelis who wanted to convene to form a network of community mediators to address disputes among adjoining communities. And it wasn't easy for the organizers to find a place where the Palestinians didn't have to crawl across police lines and so on, but they found an ancient monastery there uh, on the green line, the line uh, dividing uh, Israel and the Palestinian lands from, uh, and so the Palestinians came in one door, the Israelis came in another, and there was a quite a large group, not quite as large as this group, but let's say 80 or 90 people. And, uh, and right in the front row, one of the Israelis was in full police regalia, and he had a huge weapon with him. And I could tell that it was making uh, our Palestinian colleagues uncomfortable. Uh, and, but no one wanted to say anything. Because, and that's also, also a, a, a typical pattern for a lot of us, is we avoid conflict. And they didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to raise a tense issue that might destroy the possibility, this is the first meeting, of destroy the possibility of this network going somewhere. So early on, they, they asked me uh, for, you know, to say something and maybe a little bit about what it would take to make a network and so on. So I said, uh, well, if you're creating a network, maybe one of the first things, I thought, okay, I'm the outsider. Maybe I can say something here. So I, I thought, well, if you're forming a network, maybe you want to think about ground rules. Are there, you know, for example, should you allow weapons in the room? <laughs> and as soon as I said that, of course, everyone started to laugh a little bit, smile, because I named the problem. We began to engage. You have to move into the heart of the conflict. And then, of course, the, the man who was wearing uh, the Israeli police uniform began to protest and say he was really interested in being a community mediator, just his day job was the police. He didn't have time to, you know, by regulations, he would have to go home and drop off his weapon. He didn't have time, otherwise he would have missed the meeting and so on. He was explaining it. And then we had a little bit of brainstorming session about, okay, what to do about ground rules about weapons. And I remember one of the participants suggested in a brainstorming mode, he said, what if we allow everyone to bring their weapons into the room? <laughs> then I knew we had some work to do. <laughs> so the role of the third side is, is, is you know, is, is to kind of hold the hole for a moment. And uh, so that, that's, to me, the key. That's been the key to success in South Africa where it, you know, you saw what I witnessed in South Africa was the religious communities, the business communities, the university communities, the women's communities, they all got activated uh, in, in reaching out to try to create a community will to transform this conflict. Mandela was a third sider. You can be on one side and still take the side of peaceful conflict transformation. And they were in turn the, the third side within, within the society was supported by a third side outside, which was people around the world, including university students here in the United States and so on. And that created a, a kind of crucible within which a very difficult conflict could be transformed. Not ended, but transformed. The basic form could shift. Same thing happened in Northern Ireland. The same thing happened, I grew up in uh, Switzerland, I uh, spent many years growing up in Switzerland, and I, wa I, I watched the early beginnings of the European community. 
The European, you know, if you had been in, in 1945 in the ruins of Berlin or the ruins of London and you had said, 60 years from now, this is go going to be the most peaceful, prosperous part of the planet, people would have thought you were certifiably insane. But what happened was they created a larger context, an architecture of peace based on shared prosperity and a shared sense of identity, Europe, within which the ancient feud between Germany and France, a lot of ancient feuds within Europe, could be peacefully transformed. And that, to me, is the challenge that we face in the world today, is how do we create that third side? And what I'd like to do, given that we're part, this meeting is also part of the Greening Borders Conference, is I'd like to share with you just a few, maybe four, third side practical tools that I've found very useful for changing the game from confrontation to cooperation. Uh, and the very first one, actually interestingly, as I kind of reflect over the last, uh, since the time actually that Roger Fisher and I, uh, and Bruce Batten collaborated on getting to yes, the thing that probably struck me most is the single biggest barrier to us accomplishing what we want in a negotiation is actually not, as we often think it is, the other side. It's not that difficult person or that difficult group. It's actually the single biggest barrier to us accomplishing what we want is right here. It's ourselves. It's in our own human tendency, all very natural tendency, to react, to act without thinking. As Ambrose Bierce once put it, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that happens time and again. Uh, I've seen, even though negotiation is supposed to be goal-oriented behavior, we actually, we, we lose it and it's very natural, particularly because the issues are tough, the emotions are high. And uh, to me, the key ability, the foundation ability, the foundation third side ability and the foundation negotiation ability is in the ability to step back for a moment. And I like to use the metaphor of almost like you're negotiating here on a stage, part of your mind goes to a balcony overlooking that stage where you can get some perspective. It's the skill that academics would call perspective taking, the ability to step back for a moment, find a place of calm and perspective where you can see the big picture. So that, for example, in, the, in, the, um, in this conference right now on greening borders, one of the, one of the great things is is they've taken, they've taken a step back and they've assembled many players, many voices that aren't normally heard on the issue of the Tijuana watershed. The ability to say not just who's at the table, but who's not at the table, who needs to be at the table, who needs to be involved, remembering that if people are not involved in the process, you cannot expect them to approve the product. And there's also just sheer emotion. I remember once, uh, if I may just share my own uh, w w uh, personal story. Some years ago, I had been uh, asked, invited by President Carter to see if I could be of assistance in the emerging conflict in Venezuela between uh, the President, Hugo Chavez, and his supporters, the Chavistas, and the people who wanted him out of office. There had recently been a coup d'etat, uh, there were literally a million people on the streets who were supported him, a million people on the streets who opposed him, there was violence, and there was widespread concern in the international community that this situation there was going to tip into a civil war, not unlike the way in which civil war tragically started in its neighbor, Colombia, 40 years before. And uh, uh, I, I was involved trying to, they at first asked, can we activate the third side here? Can we build a, a, a kind of community? Uh, and I was going down there, and at one point after the second or third trip, um, I was uh, invited to meet with uh, the president, with Hugo Chavez, and uh, I, I could tell it's a long story, but let me just cut to the quick here. The second or third time that I went to see the president, I was down there, we were involved in this process, shuttling back and forth. He would not sit down and meet with his opposition. They didn't want to sit down with him either because they, uh, they just, uh, 
there was no way, the emotions were, were so high. He considered them traitors, they considered him a communist, and, uh, and there, were, there was no talking. At one point, I remember, I went down and um, I had a meeting with him at his uh, presidential palace at 9 p.m. And so I was there at 9 p.m., 9.30 p.m., 10 p.m., 10.30, 11, 11.30, midnight finally. Uh, I was ushered in to, to see the president, expecting to find him, of course, alone at this late hour of night, but I found his entire cabinet arrayed behind him. And uh, he asked me how things were going, and I said, well, I've been talking with some of your government ministers, and I've been talking with the opposition leaders, and it seems to me we're actually making some progress here in diffusing the crisis a little bit. And, uh, and then he just, I don't know whether he was doing this deliberately or it was just what happened, but he lost it and he leaned into me uh, and proceeded to shout at me, saying, you are a fool, you're being totally fooled by, you're naive, you're not seeing what the opposition is doing, they're engaged in all these dirty tricks, and I mean, literally all these attacks, and it was, it was about maybe, I would say, less than six inches away from my face, and for, he proceeded to shout at me for, I would say, 45 minutes. And uh, in front of his whole cabinet. And of course, you know, if, you, if I think about what was going on for me, I was thinking, I was getting defensive. What do you mean? I'm not so naive. You know, I saw, you know, this. But that's what's going on inside you. But I had, a full, you know, I was in danger of falling off the balcony. But <laughs> I remembered, uh, I remembered uh, several months earlier, I had been talking with a friend of mine from Ecuador, actually, from the Andes, who'd said, you know, you know, Bill, if you're ever uh, in a tense situation, let me teach you a little technique. He said, just pinch the palm of your hand. And I said, Hernan, what do you mean, pinch the palm of my hand? He said, yes, just pinch the palm of your hand and uh, uh, it'll give you a little tiny bit of pain, but it'll keep you alert. <laughs> so, in that moment of need, I decided to pinch the palm of my hand as a way of you know, going to the balcony and saying, do I really want to get into an argument with the president of Venezuela? Is that going to advance what I'm here for? And I realized it wouldn't, so I just thought, okay, just listen, be patient, whatever. So I just listened, and you know, after a while, uh, although it turned out to be a great while, uh, the uh, President Chavez finally, uh, at the end, just his shoulders kind of sank a little bit, and he said to me in a kind of weary tone of voice, he said, so, Yuri, what should I do? <laughs> and then that was my moment because the thing is, when you're dealing with someone who's in a highly emotional or angry state, it's, it's virtually impossible to use reason with that person. It's, you're just wasting your time. It's like beating your head against a stone wall. You have to wait until the right time. And of course, by listening, he got. So that was my cue that he was open. And then my suggestion actually was that the entire country needed to go to the balcony for a moment because it was just before Christmas. The previous Christmas had literally almost been canceled because of the conflict. And you know, the whole country needed a truce, a kind of collective time just to cool off for a moment. And then they could resume the conflict if they liked in, in January. And uh, he thought it was a very good idea. And then he started to get very chummy with me and said, yes, and over Christmas maybe you should come traveling with me in Venezuela. Uh, I'll show you the country, but then he thought, but you're neutral, maybe, maybe that won't be so good for you because you're a mediator, but he said, but, but I'll give you a disguise. And, <laughs> and uh, but in any case, so it, it was just, to me, what it illustrated was one of the greatest powers that we have is the power not to react. The power not to react. And that's what balcony is. It's about focusing on what's truly important. So that's the first skill, to having that Focusing and having that big picture perspective uh, that's key. The second, uh, which was also I tried to use in that incident, which is simply uh, the ability to listen. I mean, it, it may seem very simple and obvious, but most people associate negotiation with talking. And we talk, and we call them talks, and that's what newspapers call them. But to me, negotiation is much more about listening than it's about talking, because the key skill that you need is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the other. Because if you think about it, negotiation is an exercise in influence. You're trying to change the other's mind. How are you going to change the other's mind if you don't know where that mind is right now? And so if you observe the behavior of successful negotiators, you find that they listen far more than they, than they talk. 
It's about listening and it's about uh, respect. Those listening and respect are probably the cheapest concessions you can make in a negotiation. They cost you nothing, but they mean everything to the other side. And, uh, and so it's just, to me, it's, it's funny, but it's like um, in, in Venezuela, I, my, my own pers personal observation that what was really dangerous there, what was at risk of tipping the country into uh, a flashpoint of violence wasn't just the enormity of the dispute over political power or economic resources, but was the amount of disrespect that was being shown, the personal tax. Remember just President Chavez being livid to me that, that he was being called on the, on the TV shows that were, TV stations that were owned by his political opponents, he was being called a mono, a, a monkey, and he heard that as a kind of racist insult. And then the, the head of the opposition when I met with him was just furious because all his life, he was a devout Catholic, he would go and pray every morning in the central cathedral there in the central plaza in Venezuela. And now because President Chavez had gone on national TV and had denounced him as uh, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and an enemy of the people, you know, these kinds of personal attacks, there was a poster of his face and the thing, he couldn't walk down the street anymore without getting abused. And one government minister told me that he had had to move his children three times in the schools because he said, it's one thing they attack me, but they're attacking my children. He was just furious and it's that kind of fury that really, that kind of humiliation that really can trigger uh, 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 an escalation into violence. So to me, key thing is respect. You know, I, I've trained police hostage negotiators, you know, uh, who, who really deal professionally in cities like San Diego or New York, and it's interesting, number one lesson of dealing in a hostage situation is what? Be polite. Because if you want to try and reach someone in an agitated state of mind, if you're not polite, respect, sometimes we think of respect as something that someone has to earn, and maybe there is a kind of respect, but I'm talking about respect that is a human birthright. And so to me, setting that environment of respect is critical to moving forward and a lot of that is around, is a third side quality of creating that circle. So uh, a third uh, tool is one of the greatest powers that we have is the ability to reframe. If we want to change the game, in other words, change the game from confrontation and cooperation, we need to learn how to change the frame, the way in which we see it. We have that power. It's almost like in any negotiation, any conflict, there's a spotlight. And that spotlight can be where it often is in conflicts, which is really on each side digging into their positions, the things they say they want. We are refusing to budge. We're refusing to budge. How do you move the spotlight over here to a problem-solving conversation where the basic focus isn't so much on positions but on the interests, the needs, the desires, the concerns that lie behind those positions, what's really going on, the heart of the issue. How do you move it from positions to a search for creative solutions that benefit all sides? And it's not easy to do, but the key way of doing that, again, we think of negotiation as talking, the negotiation is more about listening, but, the, but when you do talk, it's about asking questions. Asking problem-solving questions that move the spotlight from positions to interests. If I might share a, a personal experience from an international negotiation, some years ago, I was uh, involved as a third party in a, a negotiation taking place between a secessionist guerrilla movement in Aceh, the leaders of the political and military movement, called the GAM, the Free Aceh Movement. Aceh is the northern part of Sumatra, uh, and there had been a war going on there for 25 years, or back with the Dutch, perhaps for 125 years, thousands of people killed. It's the place, for some of you who may remember, it's the place where the tsunami really had its greatest tragic impact uh, a number of years ago, and, uh, and the Indonesian government on the other side. And I remember we first had uh, a day alone with the leaders of the guerrilla movement, and so I, I was asking them, they, you know, I said, I understand your position, right? The thing that you're fighting for, which is independence. Please help me understand your interests. What are your interests? Why do you want the independence? And I remember we were sitting around the table there in Geneva, and uh, 
And there was this silence for a while, and they were struggling with that question. And the truth was that they knew what their position was, which is what we often do. We know what our position is, what we're fighting for, independence. But sometimes we don't really, haven't really thought through what our interests are. Why do you want the independence? Because uh, I was asking, is it economic reasons? Do you want control of you know, natural gas resources? Is it political control? Is it cultural autonomy that you want your kids to go to school in the right language? Is it you want a seat in the UN? What, what is it that you actually want and what's the priority? And once uh, we talked that through, it was interesting, once they were able to identify and get a little more clear about what their priorities were, then the question was, okay, how much is warfare going to help you in advancing your interests? How likely are you to, to be able to do that in the next 10 years? And they could easily acknowledge that, in fact, given the, the balance of power, they were unlikely to meet those interests in the next 10 years. And so that led to the possibility of, okay, what about if you formed yourselves as a political party, as a political movement? Could you then, you know, gain economic, political, self-rule, uh, cultural, I mean, wh wh what, what might be possible there? And they began to explore that. And it took, because it's not so easy in those kinds of movements, it took a, a year, two years of debate, uh, intense debate within the movement about, because they didn't have a political party, and they didn't think it was possible. But uh, that combined, I was very pleased to see, and again, I'm not taking, it was just, I asked that question at the moment, but there are a lot of other people involved. I'm not taking any, don't, mind you, I'm not taking any credit for this, but the, in the end, I was, re after, after, especially after the tsunami hit and they kind of, you know, it was like a reality test, uh, they actually were able to reach an agreement and it was interesting, the first governor and vice governor of the province, of the autonomous province, were actually from, the, were, 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 were members of the guerrilla movement. So again, the conflict didn't end, it just changed shape by changing the frame asking, you know, what, focusing on the underlying interests behind the positions, looking for creative options. And then the fourth tool I mention uh, is once you've done that, is the tool what I would call, I call it the golden bridge. And that is, uh, comes from a Chinese uh, strategist, a military strategist in the fifth century B.C., Sun Tzu, who wrote a book called The Art of War, but he talked about the importance of building your opponent, as it were, a golden bridge to retreat across. In negotiation, I would reframe that as a golden bridge to advance across, for both of you to advance across. In other words, what often happens in difficult conflicts is we think uh, about, we, we, when we've got an idea, we tend to push. We tend to push the other side. Uh, we tend to try and just put pressure. And of course, the more pressure you put on someone, what do they instinctively do? They resist. So unless you're much more powerful than them, you're in a standoff. What you find successful negotiators do is they attract. Instead of making it harder for the other side, they try to make it easier for the other side to make the decision that they would like them to make. And that's the, it's almost as if your mind is here in a difficult negotiation. The other side's mind might be over here. And you're here, and you're saying to them, come on over to my position. Come on over to my position. Come over to where I am. But if you, for a moment, put yourself in their shoes, it's not so easy for them to go where you'd like them to go. Because it's almost like there's a canyon, like a grand canyon, a chasm of dissatisfaction, anxiety. Am I going to look like a sellout? Am I going to look weak? What am I going to say to, you know, my people and so on? It's not easy for them to move where you'd like them to move. And so it's incumbent upon us, it's not so easy, to leave for a moment where we are and begin the conversation over here where they are and build them a golden bridge over that chasm. Make it as easy as possible for them to move in the direction you'd like them to move. I'll give you just a, a very uh, simple example and then I'd like to um, just check. Also. Yes, good. Uh, a simple example. Uh, from, uh, it comes from Southern California, from Steven Spielberg, the, the film producer, who recounts that when he was about 13, there was a bully who was 15 in his class who beat him up, made his life pure hell for an entire year. I mean, he would run home from school, dive under his bed, call out safe to himself. 
Till one day he asked himself, how do I get this bully off my back? And he, so he went up to the bully one day and he said, you know, because even then he was making kind of home movies, he said, uh, you know, I'm making a movie, a home movie about fighting the Nazis. And I was wondering if you would like to play the war hero. <laughs> the bully laughed in his face, but a couple days later he came back and said, okay. So young Spielberg took him up, dressed him up in fatigues and backpack, the whole works, made him the war hero in his movie. And after that he reports, that bully who would beat him up for an entire year became his best friend. His best friend in high school was this bully. So the question is, what's the logic, what's the psychological logic by which a bully gets transformed into a best friend? Why does a bully bully? Well, and bullies aren't only found in the, in the schoolyard, they're found in the larger world, unfortunately. Wh where, why does a bully bully? What's a bully looking for? Attention? What's that? Control, right? Attention, control, power, so respect. And so what does Spielberg do? He says, what do I have at my resources to basically meet some, what turn out to be basic human needs? You know, bullying, interestingly, it doesn't come from a feeling of security, it comes from a feeling of insecurity. And so he, he figures, okay, how can I meet those needs? And in doing so, he transforms the bully into his best friend. Now let me just, uh, uh, when you're bridging, when you're trying to build that bridge, particularly for the delegates of the conference, you know, you're faced with uh, like an environmental conflict, like here, the Tijuana watershed, you're faced with dozens of parties very complex issues. And so I want to just suggest one bridging methodology that I think might be of use or uh, might be of consideration. And to talk about that, I'll, uh, uh, when I was a, a graduate student still at Harvard, um, I was involved with a number of professors, including uh, uh, my mentor, Roger Fisher, and we um, uh, it was the time of the 1978 Camp David Peace Summit, and uh, uh, we sent in a memo suggesting a certain method that had been uh, used uh, prior that we'd studied uh, in, in the law of the sea negotiations, and it's, it's called the single negotiating text method. And I'll, I'll tell you this in, the, in this context because it ended up being used at Camp David. Uh, and so at Camp David, uh, if you recall, you know, it was, you know, the Egyptians and the Israelis, it was Prime Minister Begin of Israel and uh, President Sadat of Egypt, and our president was President Jimmy Carter at the time, and they came with their positions, you know, and uh, Prime Minister, uh, Pr President Sadat wanted the, for example, the entire Sinai Peninsula back, which the Israelis had occupied in the 67 war. And Prime Minister Begin was insisting on keeping about a third or a quarter of the Sinai Peninsula. Those were the initial positions. Now in a normal negotiation, what do you do? You kind of go back and forth, and that's what they started to do. And, but you know, where do you draw the line in the sand between those two positions? Uh, after a couple of days of not, not working, they, they decided to use, explore using this single negotiating text process instead. Uh, it's a very simple uh, process and essentially it means instead of starting from the two positions, the Americans went back to the, the Israelis and the Egyptians and said, don't change your positions. We're not asking you to change your positions. Just tell us a little bit about what are your interests, what are you really concerned about, what do you really need? Why is it you want the entire Sinai back, you know, for example, to the Egyptians? Well, sovereignty, it's, the land's been ours since the time of the pharaohs. To the Israelis, well, why, why do you want to keep part of the Sinai? Well, security, you know, Egyptian tanks have rolled across this and attacked us and so on. So then the question becomes not how do we draw a compromise that might be clearly unsatisfactory between the two positions, but rather how do we meet those two interests? How do we reconcile those two interests of sovereignty and security? And so there was an idea floating out there, a wild idea of, well, why not uh, allow, give the entire Sinai back to Egypt, which was, you know, entire sovereignty to Egypt, but at the same time turn the Sinai into a demilitarized zone so the Egyptian flag could fly everywhere but the Egyptian tanks could go nowhere. And uh, so the Americans put that in a proposal and then they come back with a proposal, 
to the Egyptians, the Israelis, but they say, look, this is not a proposal. We're not asking you to accept it. All we're asking you to do is criticize it. Tell us where it doesn't meet your interests. Well, no one likes to make a tough decision, but everyone loves to criticize. So the Israelis <laughs> criticized, Egyptians criticized, then the Americans went back and tried to see, could we improve the idea and make it better for one side without making it worse for the other? Then they took it back, said, this is not a proposal, just more criticism, got more criticism. They went through, I, I think it was about 22 or 23 drafts in the course of 10 days. And at the end of that, they came to a point where there was no way they could improve it for one side or without making it worse for the other. And only at that point did President Carter take it to Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat and say, look, this is the best we can do. Do you want it or not? And in that case, Sadat and Begin were faced with a very different decision than they were under the normal negotiating process of positions, which is instead of, you know, each time you hold on to your position and no one wants to be weak and give in and make that first concession, instead of having to, you know, uh, make politically painful concessions all the way through, they only had to make one decision at the end. Not when you don't know if it's a slippery slope, you don't know where it's going to end up, but only at the end when you could see exactly what you're going to get in return. And Sadat could see he was going to get the entire, you know, Sinai back. Begin could see that he was going to get this peace with, 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 with Egypt. And under those conditions then, uh, they chose to, you know, to, to, to say yes. So my question for, for example, the Greening Borders Conference is, the, one, the wonderful thing about using a single text, because if you have an environmental group and a national group and a federal authority and every, everyone's got their own positions, and if you've got, you know, a dozen positions, it's really difficult to move. But if the virtue of having a single text that is non-official, that is simply uh, an idea that continually gets circulated among multiple parties where everyone can mark it up, everyone can tell you what's wrong with it, and you have, you know, drafters who are continually improving that text over time, it allows much wider participation and no one has to agree to anything until they can actually see at the end whether their interests are truly being met in the document. And that's a way of building a golden bridge, of involving. And there are many other techniques that, that, that it could be suggested, but I just wanted to suggest that one. So those are just four techniques, to, uh, four third side negotiating techniques to think about. The balcony, which is perspective taking, listening and respect, which is often empathy to, uh, reframing, the power of reframing, and the power of bridging. And uh, I would say that the third side, the third side in a sense, what it does is it allows people to find common ground. Actually, if you think about it, the third side is common ground. It's the sense of the whole. And early on in my, um, in my career, um, I, I, I was very passionate about the question of seeing whether we could find a way to reduce the risk of nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union back in the 80s when there was a lot of talk about a winnable nuclear war. And so what I discovered is, okay, you move into the heart of the conflict and you look for where is that common ground even among people who radically disagree about everything else. And in that particular case, what I was looking for and my colleagues were looking for was, was that where's that common ground? And what we found it actually interestingly was that no matter whether you were a dove or a hawk, whether you were Soviet or American, there was one thing everyone could agree upon. No one wanted an accidental nuclear war. You know, just by definition, no one wants an accidental nuclear war. No one wants an inadvertent nuclear war. And yet that probably was the greatest danger. And so we started to work on that uh, and developed uh, with members of Congress and so on uh, some, you know, uh, some centers, nuclear risk reduction centers, to reduce the risk of nuclear war where Americans and Soviets, in Moscow and Washington. And it was interesting to me that that idea, those nuclear risk reduction centers, which a group of us were working on, interestingly enough, became the very first agreement that President Reagan and, and General Secretary Gorbachev were able to reach in Geneva. Now, let me just come for a moment to 
um, to the Middle East for a moment, which for most of us, and for anyone who's involved in conflict resolution, it's the most frequent question you got. Okay, you're in the conflict resolution business, what about the Middle East? You know, it's, it's the conflict that receives the most attention around the world. And it's widely held and regarded as absolutely impossible. And what I'd like to suggest is that maybe it isn't. Uh, I, I, I've been observing and a close student of that conflict for, for over 30 years now, and it's stuck for sure. But where is that common ground? And this is uh, the genesis of a project um, that I've been working on, which is to try to unstick the conflict by coming at it from a completely different angle, which is to look for where's the common ground symbolically in the story, which of course is in the figure of Abraham, from whom everyone traces their descendants. Three and a half billion people on the planet trace the origin of their spiritual tradition to, to, to the story of Abraham. But it's not just tracing it to a single figure, but it's to a figure who represents, whose basic message is that everything is one, confirmed by modern science, of course, that everything is connected, everything is interconnected, all is one. And, and whose basic virtue is kindness towards strangers, is hospitality. And so, uh, so what my colleagues and I have been working on is trying to go to the heart of the conflict, the heart of the story, and then to bring that into the heart of the Middle East by organizing uh, or reawakening, I would say, dusting off the footsteps of Abraham and reawakening the ancient trail, the ancient path that Abraham and his family, Sarah and Hagar and his family took 4,000 years ago or is believed to have taken from uh, his, one of his traditional birthplaces in northern Mesopotamia in southern Turkey, in the city of Urfa and Haran where he hears the call, all the way down through Syria, Jordan, uh, uh, Israel also, uh, and uh, ending in the Palestinian city of Hebron or Al-Khalil, which is named after Abraham where he's buried. A lot of people thought this was absolutely a crazy idea, no way, no one is ever going to travel there. Uh, and so uh, we studied the idea a lot, we studied the potential the idea at Harvard, and uh, I made a number of trips there consulting, and people said it was absolutely, a lot of people say it's absolutely impossible, so we did a, a demonstration trip, a demonstration journey where we took uh, 25 people from 10 different countries of all faiths, uh, have priests, uh, uh, a sheikh, a rabbi, and, and, and actually retraced the, the footsteps of Abraham. And there was enough interest in the region, even with all the conflict in, uh, in this kind of uh, tourism, that uh, host committees have started to assemble, and I'm pleased to say that this year, actually, uh, it's no longer just a vision or a crazy idea, it's an incipient reality. We now have hundreds of people beginning to walk every month parts of the path, the first segments of the path that are now open in the West Bank, where one would never have imagined it possible, in Jordan, in, uh, in Turkey, and even in Syria and so on. There's actually one gentleman here in the audience who was telling me that he traveled down the path with a group last year and that it was the most extraordinary trip of his life, and that's what we generally find. It's, it's amazing, uh, and uh, if I might just mention, since uh, our conference is a, is a U.S.-Mexican conference, uh, you know, it's quite amazing that, to me, the majority of travelers on the path in this very fledgling form, despite the widespread fear, are women who are natural third-siders. And one woman in particular was a young Mexican woman who this summer, she's a university researcher in Britain, would heard about the path, and she insisted she wanted to travel, and she wanted to travel alone. We said, no, 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 you, know, you should wait, we're not ready, whatever. She absolutely, she had the vision, she had the call, and she set off, and she traveled alone in Syria for a month, being passed from one village to another. So, uh, it's just, it's, it's starting to happen. I invite all of you, uh, because the path is actually created by people walking, as uh, in the words of, uh, of a Spanish Civil War poet, uh, Antonio Machado, who said uh, in, in one of his poems, he said, Caminante, no hay camino. Uh, 
se hace camino al andar, which means traveler. There is no path. The path is made by walking. And so the path is emerging as people begin to travel, and as any path is, and it's, it's emerging as the hosts in these villages because uh, there's incredible what you discover when you travel to the Middle East is our perception is hostility, but the reality when you are in those villages is hospitality. And the difference, if you think about it, between hostility and hospitality is the word pita, which is like pita bread, and that's, that's what happens is you share, <laughs> and that's what Abraham signifies, of course, is, is hospitality. So I, I, I invite you to consider co-creating the path by traveling the path and, and participating. Let me just end, if I may, by, uh, by saying, as you can tell, I am, uh, perhaps can tell, I'm, I'm an aficionado of peace. And I, and, I, and I honestly, despite having spent time in many, many war-torn areas, still believe that conflicts can be peacefully transformed. And I'd like to share with you just one last story from the Middle East, one of my favorite stories about, uh, a ma that sums up to me what this is all about. There's a, a story about a man who passed away and left to his three sons as his inheritance, 17 camels. To the first son, he left half the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. Well, the three sons tried to divide 17 by 2 and by 3 and by 9. It doesn't divide by 2 or 3 or 9. And each wanted more, and they started to get into a conflict, and temper started to rise, fraternal relationships started to get strained. So finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. And a wise old woman, a third side, as it were, she thought about their problem for a long time, and finally she came back and said, well, I don't know if I can help you, but at least if you want, you can have my camel. So the three brothers said, okay. They took her camel, that meant they had 18 camels. 18 does happen to divide by two, it happens to be nine, and 18 does divide by three. 18 divided by three is six, and 18 divided by nine is two. So nine and six is 15, plus two, 17, they had one camel left over. <laughs> they gave it back to the wise old woman. <laughs> now, if you think about that story for a moment, I think it will resemble a lot of the difficult conflicts that we get engaged in. It seems absolutely impossible. Somehow what we need to do is take a step back from the situation, go to the balcony, change our perceptions a little bit, like that wise old woman, the third side, and come up with an 18th camel. And my hope is that this, the ideas we're talking about, which are actually not new, these are, this is the oldest human heritage, really, of the third side, can be one such 18th camel. And that is why this school of peace is so, is so important, because it is a place to gather the third side. It's why the institute is so important, why this conference is so important, and why each one of you is so important. Because there's an old African proverb that goes, when spider webs unite, they can halt even a lion. And to me, each one of us has that power to weave a certain web, and together we can halt the lion of war. Thank you very much.